technical difficulties with Zoom, um, we've rescheduled to 1.30. So I really appreciate all the work IT has done to get us online, that the work search has done with IT to get us online, um, and everybody's patience in holding the time. Um, I know it's been a little bit of a wait. Um, so the, the uh, reason we're meeting or the, the focus of the meeting today is the uh, bill that we were working on um, most of the work we did before we left in March on uh, school construction. And if the committee uh, remembers, we were looking at a, a proposal that would have um, uh, gotten us an assessment of, uh, of school facility needs and school construction needs. And um, we had done some very preliminary work on a redraft that is what I'm hoping the committee will dig its um, teeth into a little bit. Um, today. And um, Mark is with us to give us a little bit of context just to sort of remind us what um, there was some uh, information about school construction needs and so on um, that got a discussion going in March. Um, so he's going to do that. Uh, Becky Wasserman is here to walk through the redraft, which is very much in draft form. It needs more committee work on it. Um, and also just to remind everybody, the bill itself is a bill that started in the House Education Committee. So it's a bill that that committee um, is it, certainly interested in having us move. Um, and I think, uh, I think all of us were sort of of a mind that this was an issue that we needed to start to get our arms around. So uh, before Mark starts, let me see if anybody has any announcements that they want to make. I understand that my uh, internet is freezing up occasionally. If I need to uh, stop the video, I'll do that so that at least I can talk. But um, anyway, anything going on? Anybody want to throw out there? No? Okay, Mark, why don't you go ahead? Okay, hey, so good morning, everybody. Um, we had sort of been in, in the middle of this when the COVID-19 um, crisis hit. So I can, I'll can i just remind you briefly, I think, where we were um, before this bill came up. Um, starting in, I think, 2008, um, uh, the Capitol bill no longer provided school construction aid to districts. Prior to that, most projects had been eligible for a 30% grant for approved projects. Um, between 2008 and um, about up to the time we are now, there were primarily um, emergency projects that went forward. There wasn't a whole lot of activity. However, um, in 2018 and 2019, both um, Burlington and Winooski went ahead with projects um, that totaled about $128 million. And um, South Burlington had been also considering a, a, a large um, project that ended, ended up um, not passing. And so I'm not sure where that is right now. But what brought this to everybody's attention is it looked like because of the outstanding need that existed statewide, school districts were starting to go ahead and finance school projects, even in the absence of any aid. Um, one, one thing that a lot of people um, haven't understood is that even in the absence of a grant out of the construction bill, schools that go ahead and um, issue bonds and begin to repay those bonds are actually receiving some money from the education fund. And that happens because the principal and interest payments on school debt that's acquired becomes part of the district's education spending number. I'm in confusion. Ask any questions if there's, if I'm losing people along here, but um, you would, the district would issue a bond. It would have annual interest and principal payments to pay on that that would show up in their education spending per pupil number and affect their tax rate. But because no district on the homestead side draws, you know, raises all the money that they spend, districts were receiving some money to help with their school construction projects. One of the concerns was that the districts that were able to pass bonds and move ahead weren't necessarily those districts that had the greatest need. And in districts where um, even some health and safety concerns were raised, those districts were unable to um, get voters to approve um, a budget. So there was a concern about the amount of money going out and the fact that it would not um, have any state oversight on it raised a number of issues. Um, under the old system, if you were going to get a 30% grant, you had to come in and ask for approval 
for what you spent and you would only receive state aid for those that portion of your costs that were approved by the agency of education under current law there's no need for a district to come in and seek approval unless they're bumping up against the excess spending penalty and the reason for that is that if you if you're hitting the excess spending penalty you're able to deduct your debt service from your education spending per pupil just for the calculation of the excess spending penalty for nothing else um what's so, the logic behind that mark i'm sorry say that again i'm not I'm, what's the logic behind that behind what uh, uh not including the uh debt repayment and excess spending um I'm, I'm not sure what the logic is. I guess it's just that that's a different kind of cost. I guess it's a, it's a long-term um, obligation. It's not part of your annual operating budget, um, but um, I actually don't, don't know the reason for that. Um, there's, a, there's a whole range of, there's about a dozen different things that you can um, subtract from your education spending if you're bumping up against the excess spending threshold, but the one by far the largest of them is um, capital debt. And that's been excluded since the excess spending penalty was put into place a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, does anybody have any questions on that? I didn't have a whole lot more to add um, except to that. But, um, right. Um, so the, the um, I don't know if it's Mark, if it's you or Becky, and if I'm freezing up, can somebody just flag, flag it and tell me? Um, um, the bill that we were looking at was not going to change the way we finance capital um, projects or even really put any controls on it. It was really an effort to um, uh, get an assessment of what the capital needs were, um, really doing a, a statewide assessment um, so that we would have a, a better idea of what kinds of expenses were going to be coming at us over the next I don't know, decade or two, really. Um, so, um, so that that was the I think that I think that's what the bill that came out of education did. And it certainly was the conversation we had in our committee. So, um, that, yeah, I'll, I'll just confirm that um, the bill was not um, sort of opening up any aid again. And in fact, it just had the treasurer looking at how to the, sort of the opportunities and challenges for funding and that wouldn't happen until 2023 so it was a few years out where you would even get to the step of looking at funding sources uh, so um becky will you um will you uh, walk us through the draft and I, i'm i'm I don't remember whether this got presented to the committee or not. I know I'd worked on it. I think Scott had seen it. I think George had seen it. I'm not sure if the committee did. Um, so yeah, I don't believe I presented this to the committee before. Okay. This is new for most of the members and I'm having to get my memory refreshed on what was in it. So, um, okay. Um, so this um, draft is uh, the sections one and section two of this language is the same as what came out of house education. Um, so I don't know if you want me to just go over those quickly again. I think it'd be good because I don't know about everybody else's memory, but mine's a little hazy. Sure. Um, so section one is looking at um, the secretary of education um, coming up with uh, facility standards and also the state board coming up with a capital outlay financing formula. So in subsection A, the secretary uh, of education is tasked with working with um, the executive director of the Vermont Superintendents Association, the chair of the state board of ed and the commissioner of buildings and general services to update the school construction facility standards and the update uh, should reflect modern educational requirements and opportunities. And that would be due on January 15th of next year. It's actually kind of in that last sentence um, is sort of interesting in the world that we're in right now. <laughs> what we were talking about for modern educational requirements and opportunities might have been very different in March than they are today. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Yeah. Um, a whole new Zoom world. Um, yeah. Subsection B uh, is looking at um, the state board adopting a, a new ca uh, capital outlay formula. 
So currently there is a state board rule um, 6124.1 um, that has uh, a capital outlay formula and the state board under statute is required to update this annually. Um, because this program has been on hold for a number of years, the formula has not been updated in a while. Um, so this is just asking the state board to update this rule. Um, so that establishes the max and min square footage parameters by school size and grade range through a square footage allowance per student or program. And the formula also establishes an allowable cost per square foot of construction. And that would be due uh, January 15th of next year as well. Um, section two of the, of the uh, draft is uh, looking at doing a, a facilities condition analysis of schools statewide. Um, so the Secretary of Education would do this in coordination with the Commissioner of BGS. Um, and the first step would be issuing a request for proposal for a school facilities condition analysis to inform AUE of the um, statewide school facility needs and costs. And it would be looking at both school facility conditions and space needs. And um, that would be issued by February 15th of 2021. Um, subsection B has the Secretary of Education contracting with an independent third party to conduct this analysis and the analysis would be completed on or before June 15th of 2023. So that is uh, a bit of time to allow for the analysis to be completed. And then subsection C appropriates 1.5 million from the Ed Fund uh, to the Secretary of Education to conduct this analysis and contract with that independent third party. And subsection D uh, defines school so um, to, to sort of clarify what schools would be uh, part of this statewide uh, facility conditions analysis. And the definition that was chosen here is the same one that is used um, in the current school construction aid program statute. So it was just um, uh, staying uh, consistent with that. Do you need to go check on somebody? Uh, sorry, I just had a <laughs> an interruption. Um, so section three uh, is uh, the new language um, that was drafted for this bill, uh, for this version of the bill. Um, it is uh, asking uh, JFO to come up with a, a report. And this is a little different than from the house version, which had the state treasurer doing something similar, although looking what, what they're looking at is, the report will have some different information. Um, so on or before December 15th of 2020. Um, so this year, JFO would submit to um, House Education, Corrections and Institutions and Ways and Means, and then on the Senate side, Education, Finance and Institutions, um, the following uh, list of information. Um, so that includes an overview of the recent history of Vermont school construction funding, an analysis of the challenges and opportunities to the state, if any, of funding school construction projects, a review of the experience of other jurisdictions, and then um, finally some options to address school construction needs in the state, including funding oversight and setting priorities. Um, subsection B uh, allows JFO to have the assistance of um, Ledge Council, the state treasurer, the Vermont Bond Bank, and the Agency of Education, and then any other state agency or department as needed. And um, as part of the, its work, JFO would also um, consult with the School Board Association, the Superintendent's Association, and the Vermont Board of Education. Subsection C, um, this is, uh, I guess, a decision point, um, is appropriating money to JFO of uh, not more than $30,000 for consultants um, or study expenses for the report and um, the source of funds uh, needs to be uh, filled in there about where, where that uh, funding would come from. Um, section four uh, is, is new, and this is um, also new, and this is addressing the issue of, um, you know, this 
this work is being done in the background, but in the meantime, schools still can um, do bonding for school construction projects. So this is sort of putting a halt to any new projects um, for a certain time period. And again, this is has has need some work as the dates are not finalized. But um, the language right now says that beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending at some date, um, the sc a school district shall not approve a bond for a school construction project unless the bond is not more than a certain amount of money. Um, so if the committee wants to, to leave this in, that, that would need to be decided. And then finally, section five is the effective date. So um, this would take effect on July 1st of this year. All righty. Uh, let me see if there's any questions um, from committee members. I guess the first thing um, I'd like to gauge is um, the committee's interest in pursuing this. If we're going to pursue it, I think we need to come to some agreement on it pretty quickly. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, something that George mentioned the other day, but um, if we can uh, write this in such a way that it might be eligible for CRF, um, at least in, in part, if not entirely. Um, and I go back to that first section, which talked about modern, you know, modern needs and so on. Um, it seems to me that it's possible to add, to rewrite that a little bit and add a subsection that talks specifically about um, the remote learning uh, challenges that we've had um, and maybe kind of wrap that in there. But um, uh, I've got Robin, uh, George, I'm sorry, did I take your issue? You were... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I gave you credit though. Uh, Robin and then Scott. Thanks. Um, yes, I, and I like George's uh, issue also about Great the, idea. CRF funds. Yeah, so I think this is a good idea. I like the idea of uh, rewriting where we need to to address the new world. Um, I'm, I am wondering about some of the dates and whether, especially the nearer term dates of December and January, whether yeah. given where we are, whether those need to be changed. Um, but otherwise, I, I like the concept that we're working towards. Okay. Scott, you had your hand up and I don't see it up anymore. Did you want to speak? I'm not speaking. Jim, Maslin, we'll get back to you. Yep. Yeah, um, <clears throat> with regards to Robin's or your comment, both of your comments about remote learning and the challenges um, yeah, we should put some words in there, um, not too complicated if we can put them in. Um, I'm aware, and maybe many of you are aware too, that um, there are teaching issues with regards to um, teaching learning that are the schools are working through. And it doesn't go in this bill because this is the bricks and mortar. Um, but we should be aware that those things are out there and... Um, as I heard from one head of school, they found that um, some teachers who weren't the best classroom teachers have turned out to be remarkably remote learning teachers and others that were excellent classroom teachers are struggling with remote learning. So, so it goes, you know, but it's just something that we need to consider. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think it's a good, good point. Um, Scott, you're back on. Yeah, I am. Sorry, I'm in and out. I um. I had scheduled something for this afternoon, so I'm multitasking right now. It's okay. Um, regarding the language at the end, there's a, a block in there for calendar dates to exclude this type of spending. I thought at one time we had had something in there that said that a, a school district could, if it was for um, health and safety reasons or something that, you know, really needed to get done or we just couldn't educate kids. Um, did that, was that my imagination or did that go by the wayside or? No, I, I think, again, this, this, is, this draft is very rough at this point. Um, and I um, really am using it as a starting place for us to talk. I think that, I think you're right, Scott, that if, if we were gonna do any kind of moratorium and the committee has, has not really discussed that, that's a big decision. Um, but if we were gonna do that, um, I think we were, were looking at exceptions for health and safety um, kinds of things. So. Um, I don't. I don't know how uh, how open to doing a moratorium people are. Um, 
George, did you have your hand up again? Did I miss it? Well, I was just going to say that, yeah, we, Scott's absolutely right. We did talk about it. It may not have made it into the draft, but we absolutely discussed that we would want that exception in there. Yeah, right. Yeah. The other thing that um, I thought uh, the smallest group of us that were working on this were going to do that's different than the draft, I thought the Joint Fiscal Office was going to do the contract, the RFP and the contract for the assessment. I didn't think we were going to ask the, um, the um, Secretary of Education to do it. Um, so that maybe was a misunderstanding, but I've just sent Catherine a note. Uh, so, okay. And she, and she wants to discuss that. <laughs> um, so, um, so open question about who does it, I think, um, and how that gets done. Um, my own preference would be to have the Joint Fiscal Office do it, not to do the assessment, but to do the RFP. Um, flexible about timing, um, but you know what happened, my observation is if they don't do it, um, we tend to just go to them to assess it anyway, to assess what we've gotten um, for better or for worse. I think mostly for better. Uh, those are the people that I feel most comfortable depending on um, for guidance. So um, they, they've earned the extra work in this case. Um, so I hope Catherine's listening to that. Um, and, and I'll just add to that, to something to consider is that I, I think um, there was testimony from BGS on this in house education mm -hmm. um, that they, uh, they have uh, an RFP that they've done recently for state building um, facility conditions assessments. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to really work off of what was already completed by BGS. And that's why the language um, had coordination with BGS. Yeah on yeah. that point. Yeah, I, I think it'd be really important that BGS be involved and that the Secretary of Education be involved. It just, um, oh, Catherine's now joining me. <laughs> Did you want to speak, Catherine? <laughs> um, sure, well, I appreciate the vote of confidence. That was, I'm, um, you know, it's not an area that we know much about school facilities we don't have a relationship with them we can talk about we, we can keep talking about this but i'm also worried about given um everything that's going on with this session going on forever putting out an rfp is um it's a is lot of work yeah so so we let, let's keep talking and try to figure out but i do understand uh, i appreciate your <laughs> all right flattery will get me everywhere yes <laughs> um so uh, let me see what else is. Um, so uh, Mark um, also just sent me a note, speaking of multitasking, um, which, which is um, actually very helpful. You know, the, the timing issue is such that we would like to push it out in order to give the people who are doing this enough time to get it done. On the other hand, if we use CRF money, we have to have it spent before December 31st. So um, we've got a little funnel to get through there. Um, but I, I, it, it seemed it's a it's a fair amount of money. I mean, it's it's not it's not a lot when you look at the education fund, just which which is so mammoth. Um, but it is it is a significant expenditure. So if we can figure out a way to uh, use CRF, I suppose if I had to make the choice, I probably would do it later and do it out of the education fund than to do a rush job and try to get the CRF money. Um, I don't know if other people want to weigh in on that choice. Um, yeah, Mark. I just want to say, I mean, the way the way the administration has interpreted the CRF guidelines, they're indicating that the, it's when the services are performed would be the deadline. So if these guidelines hold, they're suggesting that the entire project would have to be completed by December 30th, which seems unrealistic. Well, they are us to use CRF money. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> of course, some of those guidelines may change. Who knows? Yep. Hard to know. um, anything else? Uh, committee's sort of general interest in seeing another draft, um, you know, whether we're trying to get CRF money or not. I think the first section should be written so that it it encompasses the um, 
the issues around remote learning that we um, may be encounter, you know, maybe having to deal with for a period of time. Really hard to know. Sam, um, <clears throat> I was just going to say that I think it's worth pursuing because this problem isn't going to go away yeah. no matter what, and the even if it's postponed a little bit, it's it has, to, it has to get started for it to get done, and it's it's important, and yeah. we should we should move forward. Okay, um, good. So, uh, Emily, um, two things about including the remote learning. I think it's helpful because it might um, it creates possible space for IT infrastructure to be part of school buildings, and I really appreciate that um, because that's a huge problem. in, you know, well, I guess we all know everywhere now. Um, and the second piece is what I can't get my head around is if schools are hypothetically reopening this fall, um, they're gonna, there's a lot of physical changes that will need to happen to the infrastructure of the schools. I don't know if they would yeah. rise to the level of bonding um, or something like that, but certainly things need to, are gonna need to shift. And so I don't know how any of this can fit into what's gonna need to be a little more quick and adaptive than yep. we are generally capable of or a study is capable of. Yeah, I, I think this probably is, there's probably no way that it's gonna impact what happens in the fall. Um, I don't know if there's, if, if there is an identifiable need um, that, that, that we can uh, articulate that should be included in the bill that will facilitate opening in the fall. Um, it seems to be an appropriate thing. It's, out, you know, it's beyond the assessment, but it may be something that we ought to be thinking about. And um, it may be something that the House Education Committee can you know, do some, some work on. And I guess we mentioned the exception for the health need and that the, I suppose any accommodation around COVID would count as a health need. So that would fit under that. Yeah. Um, Peter and Joey, did you want to jump in or no, jo uh, Peter? Uh, just following Emily's um, observation, very wise, I, I would say it may be uh, that accommodations for the fall that would be eligible for funding and, and that have been revealed in the experiment this spring might fit under uh, health and safety. But I almost think uh, that some of the um, a uh, new understanding of learning techniques under these extraordinary circumstances will likely long survive uh, the disappearance of COVID-19. And I, th I think Emily's right. What we need to do, and I realize this uh, gets close to the issue of prioritization, but we ought to make some space for those physical um, uh, facilities that clearly uh, could not accommodate any of the novelty um, that uh, schools have uh, embraced uh, during the odd spring, in which case they ought to get some leg up, so to say, to be able to prepare uh, for longer term accommodation under uh, distance learning unusual circumstances. And in that sense, it's a priority, uh, although I, I realize that raises a whole host of obstacles going to prioritization. But I I think space ought to be made for that. Whether you call it health and safety is maybe just a semantic issue. George. Yeah, if we're talking about projects that reopen the schools in the fall, those things should clearly be within the COVID yeah. um, CARES money. Um, you know, they, they should clearly be able to be charged to that. And yeah. I don't know if we need to make the, you know, that clear in the, this particular bill or not, but right. um, I yeah. think that's a no brainer. So, uh, you know, that reminds me um, to share what little bit I know about what's happening um, in the Senate on, I, I don't know if it's happening just on the Senate or Senate and House on the appropriation side with CRF money, um, that there's been quite a lot of conversation about um, sort of uh, uh, putting putting a fence around is sort of the phrase um, sufficient money to um, to 
backfill the education fund, not knowing exactly how we're going to do that. But um, but I know they're actively working on it in the Senate, and they may well be in the House as well. So that the hope is that once we identify that money and set it aside, we can. And as we learn more about the, you know, what um, the Treasury guidance is going to allow us to do, and what other states are doing, and so on. Um, that we'll be, find a way to put that money in the education, you know, have it have it flow through to um, basically what it would do is it would net against education payments, so it would end up in the education fund. Um, we've been talking around that for quite a while, but um, but the the plan is to try is to set some money aside to for that purpose. And if we did that, then the the changes that schools are going to, whether we do it or not, the changes that schools are going to have to make in anticipation of opening in the fall are going to fall within all that, that no matter what. Um, it's just a question about how the money gets accounted for and where it, where it resides. Um, so other, uh, other uh, suggestions for Becky, I guess, um, as she goes to do a redraft for us. Um, anything that people particularly want to see or don't see. Becky, do you feel like you have enough information to, um, to do another draft or are there questions that you well, that I think there's a big question about that last section, whether, whether we want to do that kind of a pause on uh, school construction. It may be that um, given the economic situation, it's going to self pause, I don't know. Um, George, uh, did you want to? Okay. Yeah, I mean, the last two, two parts, you know, the, the, the um, prohibition against the, the budget and also if we, I didn't feel like we actually resolved who would send out an RFP. We didn't. I could have talked with Catherine. <laughs> right. We'll see how successful I am. <laughs> I think the only thing I would... Um ask a question on for clarification is that section that sort of puts a moratorium on bonding. I don't, I think unless there was some sort of special vote, I don't see that impacting any um, construction that would need to happen in the fall that's COVID related because it's, there's just not a lot of time they for can, that. So they can bond anyway, really. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that would, right. So in terms of making an exception, I could see perhaps for health and safety issues in the future, but I think for the um, sort of COVID related infrastructure needs that need to happen, that would likely be more CARES Act funding or, or other funding, perhaps yeah. even statewide bonding that um, could be done. But I, I don't I don't know that that could be done at the local level at, at this like short notice. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, <coughs> Peter. Uh, back to um, uh, Scott uh, Beck's um, recollection, which is mine also, namely, uh, nothing, no limit that we put, uh, I'm talking about the uh, final section, whether it's in money terms or some kind of soft moratorium, would, uh, uh, would not short circuit any kind of immediate and emergency situation. I thought we had, when we had this discussion earlier, we uh, were pointed to some uh, authority that the secretary had uh, to essentially um, move along a, an emergency situation for health and safety at the local level. And I, I guess I just would say, it'd be neat to have some uh, exclusionary language saying, you know, but for health and safety, uh, whatever limits we have at the end uh, would apply, but but um, would not uh, prevent some kind of uh, quick action to remedy a safety issue. Yeah, and and to that point, there is language every year. There is uh, an appropriation every year in the capital bill for um, emergency projects. Um, so uh, I'm not. I think the the agency would be able to talk more about how that is um, sort of administered, but that is done now. Um, if like a, a, a roof collapses at a school, there there is some money for that. Mm -hmm. uh, George. 
Yeah, I think though that in this year's capital bill, that was a pretty minimal amount of money. That's I it. remember it was like fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, it is. Minimal. Typically, every year it's about fifty thousand. So that it's not yeah. that is not addressing the sort of needs going on right now. That is just annually that has been allowed about fifty thousand dollars every year since the moratorium has been put in place. Yeah, and I have to admit that I'm a little uneasy at doing a pause on new bonding. Um, on the other hand, if we don't do it, um, I'm a little uneasy on what might happen. <laughs> so um, I don't, I don't really know what the right path is on that. Um, I was a little alarmed, along with everybody else, at the amount of money that was potentially on the table this March. It was a lot. And it would have made a big difference, um, basically, to the entire ed fund, but like having a whole new school district in there. Um, so I don't know. I, th I guess what, I, what I'll suggest doing is that Becky can do another version of it, and um, we'll look at it again. And you know, I'm if the committee is comfortable with it, I'm fine um, going along with it. And um, but I. I can I can understand discomfort with it. Um, it's, it's a little bit different from what we normally do. Uh, anything else? Becky, did you have other specific questions? Um, uh, in terms of dates and whether Joint Fiscal does it, if it's okay with the committee, I'll, I'll work with Becky and with um, Catherine on that. And, um, and then we'll come back with whatever we come back with and the committee can can look at rather than try to figure it out right here. That's okay. Good, okay. Um, so thank you, uh, Peter. Just would not the Ed Committee have uh, uh, some insight into uh, language that wouldn't, would stop short of, of saying, no, you can't do this, but at the same time, uh, leave the door open for some, uh, situation where we really have to say, you know, can't you wait a year or two because this other problem is more immediate, more pressing, uh, and if we don't do it more in injurious. I, I, I just figured that they would have some insight into language. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, Becky, thank you. I know you had a crazy day, <laughs> so I appreciate your being here. Um, so I just wanted to touch base about a few other things. Um, H959, I was told that there was gonna be an amendment um, which was uh, 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 having to do with the waiting study uh, from Laura Sevilla. I have, don't see anything in the calendar. Um, haven't gotten the amendment, haven't gotten the language. I don't have anything for the committee to review. Um, if it does come in, I guess it's our committee and the education committee that would need to look at it. Um, not, it may be uh, issues on whether or not that's germane. Um, so I don't wanna take a ton of committee time until I know that we're actually gonna have to vote on it. Um, but just be aware that that may come up tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow. Scott, do you know anything more than I do? on it or are you not around? Maybe not around. Um, the uh, Emily on the H716, uh, we have uh, the, Bob, the Bob Helm Amendment and the Pat Brennan Amendment, um, which it's the Natural Resources Committee that's gonna take a position on those two amendments. Um, we've talked about both issues in our committee. Um, so I think members of our committee are probably more familiar with the issues, but we're not gonna have a formal position out of the committee on those. Um, so as far as I know, that's up tomorrow. Uh, unless Emily or Pat know any differently. I think that's what's happening. I'm still um, hearing tomorrow. Uh, yeah, tomorrow, yeah. And then the two charters, um, that's Bill and Pat, is that right? Not Bill, it's Joey. That's right, the woman who loves TIFFs. Yes. That's right. Don't worry, a local option, whatever, she loves something, I don't know. Uh, 
<laughs> um, so, so those two charters are up tomorrow. And do you, either of you need anything from Sorsha or anything before we do those? Okay. And then one final bill um, is S339 is the D annual DMV bill. Um, and I looked at it, it's 66 pages long. I asked Pat if he would look at it as well. Um, it does have a couple fees in it, so it may come in the committee. If it does, I'm hoping that we can move it back out. Um, but Pat, did, have you had a chance to look at it at all? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um... The only thing that I see is a $6 processing application fee in section four, and then in section 32, 33, and 34, there is a 200 uh, minimum, 400 maximum fine. It looks like it's underlined, so it's new, but yeah. it follows, they must have, I think they added school zone to the fines for texting and and um, so it's the same fine, but they added yeah. a zone. Right. And we don't review fines, even no, though I would, this year. we don't. Yeah. So we, but we That's do. Right yeah. And I have to admit, I was feeling a little sensitive since the transportation bill should have come in here. The discussion on the floor was all about revenue. Um, yeah. And I'm thinking, I think actually we should have had that bill. <laughs> um, so I I was thinking the same. Yeah, so I was actually, so I did say something about it in the chair's meeting. And um, so now everybody's being careful about making sure that we actually get the bills that we're supposed to look at. Um, and so I think probably this bill, even though the fee, the revenue impact is small, I think it probably will come in. Um, but if there aren't, um, you know, big issues or even small issues, if there aren't issues, we should be able to get it right back out. At least that would be the hope. And it's yeah. a Senate bill, so it's been through one body already. Thank you. Uh, that's all I had on my list, I think. Anyone else have anything? No? Good. Thank you all. Uh, yield bill tomorrow. But, so. I doubt that there is an amendment. Um, how will we know about that? Um, will we try to get together before the floor session tomorrow? If it I'm never sure when the calendar closes anymore. It seems because everything's remote, it seems like it can be open indefinitely. Um, so I don't know. I'll check it tonight. Um, and if we know in the morning, we can gather for a few minutes before the floor. Um, but it may be that we don't know. And, or it may be that it got offered before third reading or something. I, I, I don't, I know what the language is. Um, I, not sure that it's germane anyway. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to spend a lot of committee time on it if if we're not going to take a position on the floor. So, so I'll do the best I can. That's yeah. I don't have a better answer at the moment. And I I haven't heard, um, and I haven't heard if there's um, anything else coming. So, but if anyone hears, please you know please let us know. Just just for purposes of scheduling and managing our committee time and sources time. So um, thank you everybody. I can tell that Catherine, Catherine just has a